I hope that you all sitting out there can tell how good you sound singing. Uh, it's uh, a joy to get uh, to get sung sung. I guess not to, but sung at um, up here and to hear your lovely voices. This morning, the the reading is is a parable that's been attributed to Martin Buber that I've kind of adapted. Um, Martin Buber was one of the most important theologians of the 20th century, best known for his classic book, I and Thou, in which he explores a philosophy of dialogue. Um, And this parable I I encountered um, in a book by John Buren's about liberal theology, um, in which he tells a version of this parable that I'm going to tell There were once three great friends who lived together. Their names, respectively, were liberty, equality, and kinship. They lived harmoniously together. In fact, they complemented each other very nicely. Over time, though, as some relationships do, theirs began to unravel. They lost touch, and each separately decided to go her own way. Liberty was the first to leave, and she went west, journeying across the ocean before arriving in the United States. In America, Liberty's character was changed for the worse. Alone, Liberty became monstrous and irresponsible. Liberty became the freedom to exploit others and the freedom to spoil the earth, pollute the air, poison the water. In the name of liberty, people walked around in public carrying machines of mass slaughter. Measles and whooping cough came back when people stopped vaccinating their children in the name of liberty. So while liberty journeyed west, equality went east. Like liberty, equality's character was changed for the worse. All alone, equality grew monstrous. Equality led to the purging of the kulaks in Russia, to the gulags of Siberia, and forced labor camps in North Korea. Equality became a billion hands, all waving the same little red book. And equality was used to justify the banning of books and state control of the media. While liberty went west and equality went east, kinship went underground into hiding. Kinship was scoffed at condescendingly by the west as naive and primitive and quaint. And kinship was feared by the east as corrupting and divisive. But from time to time when kinship was called for, kinship rose up. Kinship found a home in liberation movements the world over and in the lives of people facing oppression. Kinship arose during the Civil Rights Movement and during the Occupy Movement, arose in the Solidarity Movement in Poland and in anti-colonial freedom movements in South Africa and India. Kinship today hides underground, waiting until it is needed, called on again. Liberty, equality, and kinship together, these three friends balanced each other out nicely. The truth is, they need one another. We'll hear from our choir. The word in sapiens in Latin means wise and knowledgeable. So in other words, our name for ourselves is the wisest of the wise. Whether we deserve this name or not is a subject of another sermon. But our Latin name for ourselves indicates that amongst the sumptuous branching complexity of the evolutionary tree, we believe that what distinguishes us from other creatures is our thinking brains. Like I said, this isn't exactly a humble name we've chosen, but it sure beats calling ourselves something like Homo erectus, where what distinguishes us from other creatures is our ability to stand upright. And in fact, if you look over the last century or so, people who have studied the human condition have proposed all sorts of alternative names for the human species, according 
According to economic theory, we are homo economicus. It's our rational self-interest that sets us apart. Mircea Eliade, a scholar of comparative religions, may have been the first to call us homo religiosus, set apart by our practice of religion. And in fact, dozens and dozens of anthropologists and sociologists and psychologists and philosophers and historians and artists of all stripes have argued that what sets us apart is our use of language, we're homo loquens, or no, it's our use of tools and technology, homo faber, no, that's not right, it must be our use of symbol. We are the animal symbolicum, as Ernst Cassirer said. Or maybe it's our sense of aesthetics, homo aestheticus. No, no, none of those are right, says the linguist, feeling excluded. We are homo grammaticus, distinguished by our use of grammar. It's funny that they each think that what sets us apart is, is what they study. That's, that's kind of interesting. But it's in this vein of thought that theologian Martin Buber calls us the promise-making, promise-breaking, promise-renewing animal. And in case you're wondering, I have no clue what the Latin for that would be. This morning... I'm going to talk about promise-making, promise-breaking, and promise-renewing. I'm going to talk about the idea of covenant, that is, the notion of promises being central to our understanding of what it means to be human. So covenant. And um, before I, I really get going, I do have a confession to make. About seven or eight years ago, I became just extremely interested in this whole topic of covenant, and I decided at that time that I was going to preach not one, not two, but a six-part sermon series on the topic of covenant. Um, and, and I shared that intention with, uh, with my worship committee at my last congregation, and, and they looked at me like this was the most poorly thought-out idea that any of them had ever heard. One of them got, got courageous and said, and said, Tom, I don't know how you're going to do it, but that, that is going to be really dull, we think. Um, so... I took that as a challenge rather than, rather than, you know, good advice. I took that as a challenge, and I went home and, and sort of thought about this, this how, could I, how could I, you know, sexy up a covenant. And, and I realized I kind of couldn't do it. Um, so instead, I just shamelessly embraced spectacle. I had been doing this brainstorm about directions I could go in talking about covenant, and my thought chain went from covenant to Ark of the Covenant, to Raiders of the Lost Ark, (laughs) to Indiana Jones. Um, And I thought that if I delivered the sermon dressed as Indiana Jones, complete with a hat and a whip and a leather satchel, um, it would make Covenant more interesting. Um, And and it only really confused people, I think. So we're 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 going to embrace the boredom. It's a, it's a, covenant's a boring word, right? It's a word that evokes thoughts of lawyers and contracts and legal documents uh, written in legalese. Um, but as a lawyer friend once explained to me, contracts, contracts are often written with an eye not only towards keeping people working together, but also towards what should happen should one side or the other decide to back out. Contracts are written with moving on in mind. But covenants are different. Covenants are essentially super serious and enduring promises about how we will endeavor to be together and how we will return, how we'll return to being together even when we don't live up to the lofty standards that we set. Think of it this way. Um, with, with a marriage, marriage vows you know, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health to love, honor, and cherish. That is a covenant a prenuptial agreement is a contract. The two are different. In our Unitarian Universalist tradition, we descend from two covenantal traditions. One of those covenantal traditions is Judaism and Christianity, way back towards the beginning of Genesis. There were a series of covenants, a series of enduring promises made between Yahweh and Abraham. The covenant between the two can be basically summarized as saying that God will provide for Abraham and Abraham's descendants while Abraham's descendants will remain loyal to God. Um, But it was a covenant, not a contract. God didn't say, sign this contract and after two years you are allowed to shop around for other deities to see if you can get a better deal. 
while I'll be able to shop around for different people to bless um, in case I don't feel like blessing you anymore. No. And if you decide to leave before two years, you need to give back 50% of the mana that you've received. No, that does not happen. It was, the point was that the point in the biblical tradition was that when either side fell short of the promises, and they both did, they both did, that they would re-enter into covenant, come back to the agreement, and begin again. So we're descended from that Jewish and Christian covenantal relationship, but also from the congregational tradition within Protestantism. Those of you who attended the installation service um, here two weeks ago may remember a couple of different guests uh, who came up that morning, a couple of different guests or that, that afternoon, recounting stories from churches in the Boston area in the 1600s. And we, we sure do know how to party here, don't we? <laughs> And, and I will fully admit that you in the pews may get sick of constantly hearing about that New England heritage, just as football fans outside New England get sick of seeing the Patriots in the Super Bowl over and over and over again. Um, but, but my guests, my guests at the installation, yeah, that one was for you, Bill. <laughs> um, where was I? <laughs> The Super Bowl? No, not the Super Bowl. Um, but but my my guests that went went back to those churches because of the way those those churches in our in our history were ordered. They were ordered around the idea of covenant. They did not share a common creed or a common catechism as much as they shared a covenantal understanding of how they would walk together in community. Those churches each had their own covenants, their own covenants of membership and of community. Um, the covenant of the Salem church was just elegantly simple and beautiful. They said, we covenant to walk together in the ways of God known and to be made known. That was their promise. That was the, their promise to each other. And today within Unitarian Universalism, roughly half of all UU churches do something in their services that we don't do in our weekly Sunday service. About half of all UU churches recite a covenant together on Sunday morning. By far the most commonly used of these is some variation of one written by a guy whose name is L. Griswold Williams. What a, what a great name Griswold is. Um, it, and it goes like this. And as I say it, you might imagine what it would feel like as a, as a church community to say these words in unison at the beginning of the service each week. Um, the, the Williams Covenant goes... Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with, divine, with the divine. Thus do we covenant with one another. How many of you have belonged to another church where there's a covenant read the service? A few, a few of you other other churches. Um, and so I bring this up not because I am of the mind that we should add the recitation of a covenant to our regular liturgy. Rather, I'm only making a point that covenant really is central to our tradition. Um, we make promises to each other about how we're, we'll be together. In this congregation, our, our board of trustees has a covenant of how they will be together. Our staff has a covenant amongst ourselves with promises we make to one another about our working relationships. Um, unprompted by, by me, Glenn mentioned that the choir has their own covenant together. And in religious education, our different classes and youth groups create covenants to guide their being together. Um, yesterday, I was in the Kirby room meeting with our caring ministry as we had a, a training. And I, I looked over there, and on the wall are not one, not two, but three covenants written by different groups. There is the, the youth group covenant. There is the um, kind of elementary school owl, class, our whole lives class covenant. Um, they also was like some our whole lives anatomical, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, teaching uh, uh, lessons that were left up there as well. Um, and then, nothing wrong with that. Um, and, then, and then there is, was the church covenant, our overriding church covenant. 
uh, in which we promise to do things like communicate with and about each other openly, to seek peaceful and constructive resolutions to conflict, to value diversity of thought, belief, and culture, and to work together to build the common good. In the reading this morning, the parable of liberty, equality, and kinship, Martin Buber imagines the destructiveness of freedom when it's severed from responsibility to one another, and the destructiveness of equality when it's severed from a more holistic vision of community. Buber is saying something about the human condition, that we are redeemed, saved, and made whole by a practice of community that can trump the excesses of ideology. Fraternity, kinship, beloved community. When Buber calls us the promise-making, promise-breaking, promise-renewing animal, he is saying something about what makes us human. We're not human because we can stand up straight or because we think or because we use tools. We're human because we can make promises. That's what he says. I haven't read a ton of evolutionary biology, but I've read enough to suggest that our branch on the evolutionary tree is set apart by our capacity for complex social arrangements. Um, psychologist Edwin Friedman, a, uh, a favorite of mine, uh, talks about how um, reptiles and mammals behave differently. That, um, uh, that with, with reptiles, that they are motivated by, by just four things, by, by fight, flight, feeding, and reproducing. Um, I, and this is, this is true. I once had a pet turtle. Um, and, and on sunny days in Boston, I would take the, you know, the turtle out of its aquarium and would take it outside and, and put it down, and the turtle would, would either go eat or run away. Our, you know, it didn't run that fast. I didn't just scoop it up. Um, but that if you put if you put mammals together, their their behaviors get a lot more complex. That whether it's you know wolves or elephants or dolphins or chimps or bonobos or gorillas or human beings, that we exist together in infinitely more complex forms of social arrangements. So much so that among us there has been proposed that there is and should be something like a social contract. The Constitution of the United States begins with a preamble that says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution. The constitution of the state of North Carolina uh, contains a clause that states, beneficent provision for the poor, the unfortunate, and the orphan is one of the first duties of a civilized and Christian state. We may, uh, we may disagree with whether the term Christian should be in there, but this is, this is the idea of, this is the idea of, of covenant, of promising, of obligation to another as part of being a complex group of human beings. Earlier this week, um, a member of the church invited me to uh, go with her um, to drive over to Raleigh on Wednesday morning for the NAACP preaching and pray-in in the legislative building, and I was really honored to go and take part in that. And, and I was touched um, by the clergy who spoke, a um, pair of rabbis and imam, two different Unitarian Universalist ministers, an Episcopalian priest, a UCC minister, a diverse clergy from uh, throughout the African-American church traditions. All of these speakers, each single one of them, mentioned in their, uh, whether it was their preaching in or their praying in, the wisdom from the prophetic tradition. And the prophet, the prophet is the person 
who reminds people, the job of the prophet is to remind people of their promises, to call them back into covenant with the promises that they have made. It is to remind people of their covenant. And I was very struck by this idea, this idea that they seem to be saying, all of them in their talks, this idea that what grounds us in human community is this fact that we are a promise-making, promise-breaking, and yes, promise-renewing people. My charge to you as you go forth is to go and take stock of your covenants. Take stock of those promises you've made. Perhaps it is a promise to a spouse. Perhaps it is promise as a mother or a father. A promise amongst family. Perhaps it is a promise within the beloved community of the congregational life of this church. Perhaps it is a covenantal promise within this idea of our larger, larger civic structure. And my first charge is for you to think on those covenants of which you are a part. And my second charge is to be a prophetic people capable of speaking of reminding people of those promises, to remind, those peop remind people of those promises, remind each other of the promises that we have made, the covenants of which we are a part. Amen. And peace to you.